So maybe I'll start with the short and possibly relevant information that that this artifact that you could see on Twitter like truly exists. <laughs> Yeah, it's the snark train that you can see on the on the uh, on the Twitter announcement. So uh, yeah, great to be here. Great, great, many thanks for for opportunity to uh, to present on MCLS this symposium on uh, special numerical associations and dissociations that uh, Jean Philippe and and me submitted for the for the conference, and we are. Yeah, maybe a bit unhappy that it's in these circumstances rather than having nice meeting in Dublin. But yeah, we have it. We have what we have. Uh, so uh, the format today is that we are we are discussing more or less the similar topics. So I would start with general introduction of uh, space number associations, and then we go uh, over the uh, the specific topics and and talks. Uh, so that we don't uh, repeat ourselves too much. So uh, special uh, numerical associations, uh, at some point we tried to build a, a definition of this, and this is the most specific form that we, that we could come up with. So that it's a wide range of phenomena, which reveals that some aspects of numbers are somehow associated with some aspects of space, which is, probably not super satisfying. Maybe we should think of Wittgenstein's family resemblance to somehow make some sense out of this, uh, that we have some like family members that are similar to one to another, but there is no like defining feature to, to all of them. And some time ago, we proposed this taxonomy of space number associations, where we uh, show that uh, we have some aspects of numbers, either approximate or exact, cardinality, place value, ordinality functions. So different aspects of numerical information, uh, different type of association. It can either be implicit or explicit. And also some aspects of space, it can be extension, like small, large area covered or so versus directions like left, right, up, down, or, or anything like that. Uh, and uh, what are the implicit assumptions in several uh, SNA research that have been done for, for quite a while? It seems that uh, people assume for most of the time that numbers are linked to space. Maybe it's good candidate uh, as an aspect of num elementary numerical processing to be associated with the math skills. But uh, what is also kind of implicit in some lit literature, at least, uh, at least according to my reading, is that most, quite often people just treat these associations as a sort of unitary phenomenon. And the researchers ask very general questions like, do SNAs relate to something? And sorry, but I mixed up the presentations, of course, and uh, just some instances here of what is what. So for instance, this extension approximate uh, SNA would be let, as like we here put uh, the numerical stroop. So we have like two numbers of different numerical values and of different uh, sizes. And then it's harder to tell, to indicate the numerically larger number if it's also, it, it, if it's physically smaller out of the pair. So we have this association of like extension in the space versus numerical uh, magnitude, but like this extension in space is not super, let's say exact, like we don't have correspondence with the font size. Extension exact would be when we have strict link between like special location and value, for instance, number line estimation. And then in directional uh, SNAs would be those that we have links between left, right side of space or up, down or near, far. Um, and this could be associated with cardinality, with place value processing, with ordinality information, and also with uh, arithmetic functions. And then implicit means that we, for instance, observe it by looking at patterns of uh, reaction times or by patterns of errors that participants do. And we don't, exp don't explicitly ask them to somehow tell whether the number 
is on the left or on the right or up or down. For instance, here the, the snark effect or the uh, special biases in mental arithmetics. And in explicit coding, it's that we really ask the participants to somehow organize the numbers in space and they do it in the kind of systematic way. Uh, so what are the aims of our symposium today? So we want to somehow challenge the construct validity of this SNAs and one can ask, okay, you made this, you made this taxonomy, you made some arrows, you made some term, you put some terms, you name some phenomena here and phenomena here and there, but does it really matter? Is it, it doesn't make sense of anything, but just like adding one more book chapter here and or there. Seems that it makes some sense because we see some dissociations within this, uh, these SNAs. So it seems that maybe it's the case that they are really not different and when they like dissociate go in the different directions. And here in this symposium, we tried to somehow provide some data on these dissociations within, uh, within SNAs. Uh, and some other pending questions in this SNA debate, maybe we ma managed to tackle some of them. So is associating numbers with space universal? Is it like the general principle of cognition or it's more like individual strategy that some participants tend to reveal why others do not? Do we have one or multiple SNAs and how different SNAs also relate to each other? And we have uh, four speakers. Uh, we start with Nicola, who uh, will tell about special biases in mental arithmetic uh, and reading habits, uh, presenting data from French and Arabic speakers. Uh, then uh, Konstantinos substituting for Sarah Alotti, who couldn't, uh, couldn't be, be here with us today, mm -hmm. will present data on SNARK in multiple directions. Uh, then Jean-Philippe will present some data on hetero on whether it's more about ordinality or, or cardinality that links to space and which of them can be a better candidate to link between um, space and numbers. And I will present also some data like uh, on how does the, like putting the constraints on the task, how does it maybe affect the, the, the SNAs that we manage to observe. And uh, like I put our uh, speakers here into this taxonomy. So I'm uh, really glad that we have, at least for the directional SNAs, we have quite good coverage with, uh, with different, uh, different speakers providing their insights. So yeah, thanks for your attention. And I switch over to Nicolas, which should, uh, yeah, probably you are able to share the screen now, Nicolas. Yep. Does it does it work? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So thank you, Christoph, for the, for the introduction. Uh, it will allow me to skip a few stuff and to be more efficient to fit in this uh, ten minute slots. Uh, so as you can read here, the, my presentation is about spatial biases in mental arithmetic and their supposed origin. So as you all know, there's plenty of studies showing that there are strong links between numbers and space processing. And first, you, are, you have obviously uh, the studies on the snark effect reporting that you are faster to uh, respond to small numbers with the left hand and to large numbers with the, the right hand. There are also plenty of studies showing that left neglect patients that are usually um, in difficulty to orient their attention to the left side of space, they also have some difficulties to process uh, smaller numbers, as if they cannot reach the representation of numbers that is located on the left side of their mental uh, space. So since the very first studies about these uh, SNAs, the origin of this left-right orientation was uh, questioned and the primary suspect uh, for the origin of the, the bias was the reading and writing direction of the participants. Uh, to study this, um, some researchers made some cross-cultural studies uh, to compare participants with left-right reading habits to participants with right-to-left reading habits. And what these first studies showed is that the snark effect was weaker or even reversed 
uh, in Farsi speakers, Arabic speakers, or Hebrew speakers. So all these people that read from uh, right to left. So for long, there was almost no debate about the origin of the, the SNAs. And the simple way to, uh, to think about the origin of spatial numerical association is that it comes from an extensive learning of reading and writing. So basically for the model, uh, we are born without any spatial numerical association. Then we will learn some cultural directional habits uh, when observing our parents reading some stories, stories for instance, or uh, when attending to school, when you are le learning to read and write in one direction or the other, depending on the, on the culture. So all these exposition uh, and the education will progressively shape um, our spatial numerical association in a direction that fits our reading direction. And then several years ago, Costas, that we'll speak after, and um, Rosa Rugani, they showed that baby chickens that obviously can't read, they already show some spatial numerical association in the left to right orientation. And actually these results were replicated several times with animals, but also with baby humans. So after these discoveries, uh, the models change a bit. And the idea now is that by default, uh, the orientation of the SNAs is from left to right, but that this initial left-right association will later be influenced by, by culture. So in our Western culture, the left-to-right orientation would strengthen through education, while in other cultures, such as in Arabic people or Farsi speakers, it would reverse and take the right-to-left orientation. So with this new model, everybody was quite happy as both nature and culture had their share in the origin of spatial numerical association. However, um, as it was introduced earlier by Christoph, there's plenty of different SNAs. And one might imagine that they take their roots in different factors. So the model I talked earlier about is um, mainly about snark effect that seems to be influenced first by nature and then by nurture. Um, but what about the others? Uh, actually, my studies, they investigate SNAs um, not on how you represent one number at a time, but when you represent, you manipulate numbers or you update numerical magnitude. So basically when you are uh, doing mental arithmetic. So the idea is quite simple. Uh, if we represent numbers uh, spatially, then processing and addition uh, would require shifting your attention from the representation of the first operand towards the representation of the answer that would be on the right. And for subtraction, it would mean that you have to shift your attention from the first operand towards the smaller number on the left. And actually we did many experiments that showed that it was the case. So there's uh, some attentional shifts related to arithmetic. And for instance, in this study, uh, we recorded eye movements while participants were looking at the blank screen while listening to additions and subtractions and while solving them. And so what you can see here is that uh, the eye is shifting more to the right while solving an addition than while solving a subtraction. So recently, we started a project aiming at finding out the origin of these uh, spatial biases in, in arithmetic. And we wondered whether uh, they were related to reading direction or not. So if so, uh, when testing Arabic speakers that read num numbers and words from right to left, the cultural driven hypothesis would predict that we should observe a reverse pattern. So an association uh, with addition and left side of space and an, and an association between right side of space and subtractions. So to do so, we recruited native Arabic speakers that um, immigrated in Belgium during the last six years. Importantly, all of them, they could not read, uh, not, neither speak French or another language that is read from uh, left to right. So we also tested, of course, a group of French speakers that were matched uh, with the Arabic, speak Arabic speakers uh, in terms of age. So to, to test the SNAs uh, in arithmetic, we used uh, a temporal order judgment task 
that was coupled with uh, arithmetic solving. So participants, they had to listen to additions or subtractions. And just after the presentation of the problem, there were two lateralized targets that appeared on the left and right side of the screen. And the participants, they had to say aloud the answer of the problem and then say what targets appeared first. The thing is that we varied the delay between the operation of the, the left one and the right one. So in some trials, the left one appeared way before the right one. In some, it was the opposite. And some, they appeared really almost at the same time or even at the same time. And the idea is that if additions are associated with the right side of space, participants would respond more often that the right one appeared first. And of course, it would be the opposite for, for subtraction. So here's the results for the, the French speakers. So the graph represents here the proportion of trials in which participants selected the right target first as a function of the delay between the two targets and as a function of the operation. So here you can see that when the left one appeared first so on the left part of the, the graph, participants almost never responded that it was the right one first. And this proportion progressively increases, which is good. So when targets appeared almost at the same time, it was more difficult. And when it's the right one appeared first, they almost uh, all the time selected the right one. And what is great here for the French speakers is that the proportion of right responses was significantly higher for additions than for subtractions, at least in the gray part of the curve. So this shows that task, the task can indeed measure spatial biases in arithmetic because it fits our previous studies in French speakers. So the most interesting part, at least for me, um, is the results for the, the Arabic speakers. Um, so interestingly, you, you can see that um, they also showed a significant larger proportion of right responses after additions than after subtraction for the gray part of the curve. So both groups show significant associations between the right side of space and additions, irrespective of the reading direction. Now, the problem is we were told that perhaps this results was because we tested Arabic speakers in Belgium and that these participants were exposed to Western culture and that this exposition would have reversed the initial right to left uh, spatial numerical association. So what we did is we included another task, which interested Christophe a lot, um, to check whether our Arabic speakers were impacted or not by the, um, by the initial right to left reading direction on both type of tasks. So we used an ordering task in which participants had to, uh, they received five cards and they had to order them on the table. So here, for instance, it represents five pictures on how to bake and eat a cake. And we did not give any instructions about the direction in which they had to arrange the card. And this, card, this task is actually known to be very influenced by reading direction. So what we expected is that Arabic speakers had to would order the cards from right to left instead of left to right, as it would happen in, in the French speakers. And this would prove that they were not influenced at all by Western culture. So we used a lot of different uh, categories. Uh, there were some numerical categories, non-numerical categories, some stories, very lots of things. And um, here's the results. Um, we categorize each participant as a left to right sorter if we arrange more than 60% um, of the series in the left to right orientation. Um, and as you can see, most French speakers arrange the cards from uh, left to right, while most of Arabic speakers, but not all of them, uh, arrange the cards in the opposite direction. So maybe uh, some of them were indeed influenced by the Western culture in both tasks, and perhaps these left-right Arabic orderers, they were masking some, some results in the temple order judgment task. So what we did is we analyzed the data uh, a second time, but only in the, um, Arabic speakers that ordered the cards from right to left. But what is really interesting for us is that even in those participants, 
the spatial biases in arithmetic was still from left to right. So addition was all associated with the right and subtraction to the left, even in those participants. So altogether, um, my results show that spatial biases in arithmetic uh, in human adults are not driven by reading direction. But now the question is, how, is to find out what is the origin of these biases, uh, perhaps by finding out when in development uh, these uh, the spatial biases occur, or even if we can observe such stuff in, um, in animals. Um, finally, if I have to come back to uh, Christoph's taxonomy, um, I would say that implicit coding for functions or for arithmetic uh, seems to be related to nature and that explicit, explicit coding that was measured by the ordering task was associated to nurture, at least in human adults. So clearly I support Christoph. Uh, we really need to distinguish SNAs because it's really possible to find reliable dissociations between them. So I'd like to, to thank you all for your attention and I hope I did I paid it in time. And if you have any questions, shoot. Thanks so much. Uh, so I think we can just like quickly switch to uh, to second speaker, which is Kostas. And if we have any urgent questions now, we can we can answer why we do the switching. Can you see the video, the, the, the presentation? Yes. OK, great. So, uh, so we I'm can concerned. start, I guess, because like I see no yes. questions. So, thanks. Great. Uh, I'm Konstantinos Priftis, and uh, I'm here uh, instead of Sara Leotti, who uh, apologizes, but uh, there was a reason for which she could not be here. And uh, the presentation is uh, entitled This Cubical Snark Effect. Uh, evidence from uh, the horizontal, the vertical, and the sagittal uh, spatial numerical associations interaction. Uh, some years ago, that is uh, 2015, there was a, a very nice, very elegant, influential review by uh, Winter and colleagues, among them uh, Martin Fisher, uh, who uh, reviewed uh, some papers, some studies, in which the classic idea of a unidimensional uh, left to right oriented uh, mental number space or mental number line and so on was uh, challenged. And uh, indeed there was uh, evidence and there is evidence that uh, probably we have rather than a unidimensional dimensional representation of numbers, something like uh, an at least three dimensional uh, mental uh, number space. And uh, uh, we investigated further this uh, issue with uh, uh, the colleagues in Padova in this uh, paper in which uh, for the first time we checked and uh, studied together all the three axes, uh, the horizontal, uh, this one, the uh, vertical, sorry, the vertical, the horizontal, and the sagittal axis by means of uh, this uh, ad hoc made uh, response box. And uh, uh, what we observed in a classic parity judgment task was that uh, we had three independent uh, spatial hand and uh, number arrangements, the horizontal here, the vertical here, and the sagittal here. And what we have seen in this classic, very, very simple, parity judgment task with a centrally presented number in which participants had to judge the parity of the presented number was a main effect uh, of uh, the spatial uh, response compatibility expressed by this classic means of representing the snark effect through a regression line. We, uh, I guess we are all familiar. If someone is not familiar, is something that we obtain when for each number, 
we subtract uh, reaction times of the left hand from reaction times from the right hand. So the uh, more positive is this difference, the advantage, the more the advantage, advantage for the left hand and the opposite for uh, the right hand. And of course, this is the main effect, but uh, also uh, when we checked, even if there was no any interaction there, the snark effects on each Cartesian axis, we found exactly a snark effect on the horizontal axis, a snark effect on the vertical axis, and a snark effect on uh, the sagittal axis. Uh, and I would like to uh, highlight that uh, the three snark effects were not highly correlated. Correlations among them varied from 0.2 to uh, 0.4. This was something uh, more suggesting maybe the independence of these three snark effects along the uh, Cartesian uh, axis. And uh, these were our conclusions in uh, our uh, paper. Now, uh, of course, the three axes can also interact. That is, uh, I can uh, put my hands somewhere that is left, up and uh, down, or uh, somewhere that is uh, right, uh, down, and uh, far. Okay, so uh, we uh, asked ourselves how we could um, create the conditions of this uh, hand space number arrangements. Um, and uh, thanks to uh, Stefano Massacesi, that is uh, our magician of the response boxes, we constructed a, a new response box, that is this one, with this time eight buttons arranged along and across something that we can imagine as a virtual cube. Okay, so uh, please imagine virtually lines connecting these uh, buttons here and uh, you have a, a virtual uh, cube. As uh, you can see, uh, buttons can be uh, either on the left or on the right can be uh, on the upper or on the lower part of space and uh, simultaneously can be uh, near or far away from the participant. So in each uh, angle of the cube here or here or here, we have combined the three Cartesian axes, that is the sagittal, the vertical and the horizontal uh, one. And uh, just a minute, let me see how I can, okay. This is better. By combining simultaneously the three Cartesian axes, we created four planes. This is plane one, when hands are spatially arranged like this. This is plane two, hands are arranged like this. This is plane, plane three, with this arrangement of the hands. And finally, this is plane four. What does this mean with reference to the uh, compa compatibility of the snark effect uh, with reference to the Cartesian axis, horizontal, vertical, sagittal, and the resulting planes? It means that in plane one, all three Cartesian axes can be compatible with reference to the snark effect. With reference to plane two means that when the horizontal and the vertical axis are compatible with the snark effect, the sagittal axis is not. Plane three means that when the horizontal axis is compatible with the snark effect, the other two axes are not. And finally, plane four means that when the horizontal and the sagittal axis are compatible with the snark effect, the vertical axis is uh, not. Uh, this was uh, what we uh, were able to combine. It is uh, extremely difficult or impossible to combine and uh, check, compare everything with everything. But uh, we did our best, and this is uh, uh, this was, is the final uh, result here. Okay, I repeat. These are. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, here in plane uh, one, we have uh, the. Uh, right, the left hand here, and uh, uh, the uh, right hand here. So uh, if we uh, have um, a classical, uh, a classic small number, 
This is compatible uh, with the horizontal axis left. This is compatible with a sagittal axis near. This is compatible uh, also with the vertical axis, that is the uh, lower part. Because in the three-dimensional uh, uh, snark effect interaction and combination, of course, uh, compatibility was between uh, small numbers on the one hand and left-sided uh, or uh, um, uh, low-sided or near-sided responses and large numbers with uh, right-sided, upper-sided or far-sided uh, responses. So this is how we derive compatibilities and uh, how we combine everything to uh, obtain this new paradigm. The task was exactly the same as the one with a three-dimensional uh, independent axis. So the uh, participants had to judge the parity of a centrally presented uh, number. And uh, uh, exactly as for the first experiment, we uh, manipulated responses in uh, three blocks, independent blocks, which were counterbalanced across participants. Here, the four planes were uh, combined and uh, responses were obtained in four different uh, blocks, which of course were counterbalanced uh, across uh, participants. The main uh, results are reported here. Each bar stands for the mean and standardized uh, betas obtained for each plane. Uh, of course, the, the lower here, the beta, the stronger is the combined uh, snark effect for its plane. And uh, uh, when uh, we compared with one sample t-test, this mean betas with zero, the classic approach for this regression, uh, regressions for uh, repeated measures, uh, we found uh, significant differences here for plane one, for plane two, and for plane four, but not for uh, plane uh, three. So if we go back here, we found significant difference when three axes are compatible, when two axes are compatible, but not when just one axis is compatible. Another uh, interesting point is when we consider coins D here, this, we can see that uh, the strongest effect is for plane one, here, followed by plane two here, then by plane four, and we have a rather small effect here for plane uh, three. What uh, we can uh, conclude, of course, are working uh, conclusions. Uh, we can hypothesize that indeed, uh, the snark effects along the three Cartesian axis uh, do interact. We uh, saw this uh, different uh, uh, effects in the statistical uh, analysis. And what is evident is that uh, when at least two axes are compatible, then differences are significant. Whereas when we have, uh, in the only condition that we have only one axis compatible, the difference is not significant. So uh, a necessary condition is that at least two axes are uh, compatible, are going towards the same direction simultaneously. But the third point is that when all the three snark effects are simultaneously compatible, that goes plain one, we yielded the highest effect uh, size. Thank you very much for your attention and I uh, thank uh, the organizers and uh, my co-authors for uh, this study and uh, for uh, the invitation. Thanks so much. Uh, do we have any questions, urgent ones, or we switch to the next one?
So I think we can switch to uh, to Jean Philippe now, and then hopefully we have time for a more extensive discussion whenever we finish the symposium. Uh, let's have a look. All right. Is it feasible like this? Yes. yes well. Okay. So thanks everybody for attending at this symposium. Very happy to see the uh, large amount of people that are uh, attending. So that's nice. Um, I'm going to talk about the heterogeneous nature of number space interactions and more precisely about uh, the way how spatial patterning, and that's how uh, here in this talk we call this um, a more general principle of mapping numerical magnitude of our order to space and how this spatial patterning can be used as a determinant for map abilities. Now, just to frame the current talk in uh, the symposium. So if we want to understand the nature of spatial numerical associations, I think we can or study the spatial component, like uh, in, in the presentations of, uh, of Konstantinos and, uh, and Nicola, or you can more focus on the numerical component. And uh, Christophe will talk about uh, symbolic and non-symbolic, or especially about symbolic uh, aspects of number processing. And in this talk, I'm going to talk about the ordinal and uh, cardinal aspects and how they relate to mathematical abilities. So here, uh, as, an, as an index of the um, auto implicit processing of numerical magnitude, I take the snark effect. Why? Because uh, in this task you need to process the parity status and nevertheless uh, you see that the, there is an influence of the numerical magnitude on the uh, responses that people give. And typically what you find is that people have faster left-hand responses to small numbers and faster right-hand responses to large numbers. And here as well you see uh, the typical depiction of the regression line to these DRTs. Now this uh, um, among others, uh, this snark effect is uh, seen as, an, uh, as, as evidence for the idea that the mental representation of numbers takes the shape of, an, of a mental number line. Typically, it's considered to be in, uh, horizontally in two dimensions, but as we've seen in the previous uh, talk, it can also be in three dimensions. It's related to reading habits, as indicated by Nicola. Um, see, people think it's a long-term representation is part of number semantics and that it is automatically activated. Now you can argue or you can discuss whether the snark, is, the snark effect is driven by the ordinal or the magnitude meaning of numbers. Um, but here I would take it from a different perspective and really manipulate the uh, necessity to code the order of information. And in this task, therefore we developed a task where we ask participants to memorize digits in verbal working memory, digits in a random order. And the, uh, the instructions of the, for the participants were to maintain the series of digits in correct serial order. And then we could see whether the maintenance of these digits in, in working memory, whether this also impacted the uh, left and right hand responses. So the setup of the task was simple, just as in a digit span, we presented a, a, a few in this, in this um, example sequences of five digits that people had to maintain. And then in the retention interval, people got digits. And the first thing they needed to do was to see whether the digit was part of the memorized sequence or not. And if it was part of the memorized sequence, so in other words, from the moment that they had, to, that they had retrieved the information from working memory, they need to do a parity judgment task with left and right hand responses. Finally, we checked then in the end of the, of the of the block, whether the full sequence was still maintained in working memory to be sure that the, the, the um, working memory representation remained there over the entire uh, block. Now, what we saw in this task was that the begin items, independently from their numerical magnitude, were associated with left and end items with their right hand responses. And we did not, did not observe uh, an effect of uh, magnitude. Now, um, the idea was that uh, we, if we, if we, from the moment that we have to maintain information in verbal working memory, that uh, we mentally organize this information, even when it is in verbal working memory, that we um, um, organize this information in a spatial manner from left to right, according to our reading habits. And from the moment that we have to retrieve information from working memory, from the moment that we have to search within this memory representation that we use spatial attention as 
uh, if we would have uh, written these different items on a kind of mental whiteboard from, uh, from left to right. So here the idea is that spatial coding is a key characteristic of representing serial order in working memory. Now, instead of investigating directly the ordinal and cardinal aspects of numbers and how it is derived in numerical association, here in this study, we take a different approach with which we also try to tackle a more general question, namely why are spatial abilities and mathematical abilities related to each other. So, and therefore we're going to use these, these two uh, different uh, tasks to study this uh, question. Now, very general, we know that spatial thinking plays a fundamental role eh, in the way how people conceive and perform mathematics. We see that people who are good, for example, in mental rotation are also good in mathematics, normally developing, of people who develop normal math skills. And you also see that people who struggle with, uh, with mathematics often, often struggle with uh, spatial processing as well. So there seems to be an, a strong relationship. Now, why and how this um, um, spatial skills and mathematics are linked is not so clear for the moment. Now, recently, Haus and Ansari proposed four mutual but not exclusive accounts. One was that maybe um, the mental representation of, of numbers, the fact that they are spatial in nature, maybe this is the reason why it is linked to, uh, to mathematics. Because if space plays such a, a central role in the semantic meaning of numbers, you can expect that those who have a good spatial representation, a strong, sem a strong semantical representation of numbers are therefore better in mathematics. That's the first account. The second one is that they uh, are related to each other because they share neural processes. A third account is that um, for because for many math mathematical tasks, you need to mentally organize your mind, you need, for example, to rotate or to imagine something, and that maybe this kind of spatial modeling, if you're good in it, also give you benefits when you have to uh, deal with mathematical problems. And then finally, in many uh, math tasks, you also need working memory. And this has been shown that people have good uh, working memory capacities and good ways to work in working memory that they are also better in, um, in mathematics. Now, if you take the previous uh, effect, so this ordinal position effect, so the spatial organization of working memory, well, here in the, in the current task, I see it as a kind of hybrid between the, the, uh, the, the third and the fourth account. So maybe the spatial organization of working memory, the spatial organization of order in verbal working memory, maybe this is related to mathematical abilities. Now, it, um, it's the link between um, spatial numerical associations and maths have already been studied not in the, um, in the context of the ordinal position effect, but there are studies which, um, on the link between snark and mathematical abilities. But there, the, the results are not so clear. There are several null results reported. Sometimes there are um, uh, effects reported, but these are often in special groups, people with very strong mathematical abilities or people who suffer from, uh, math from mathematics. So the question is whether you can generalize these findings to the, uh, the general population. It are correlational studies um, where the reliability is not always taken into account. And finally, in these correlational studies, it also tackles another problem, namely, how do you have to consider and or how, what would you expect that someone with a large snark effect, but which is measured with a lot of error, would this, would this predict a strong relationship or someone with a, sm a small but consistent snark effect? So therefore, it's maybe interesting to look at the effects at the individual level, taking this individual measurement into account. Finally, uh, very often mathematics is also considered in a rather narrow sense and restricted to mental arithmetic, while it can be the case that as spatial numerical associations uh, play a role in mathematics in, in, in other mathematical domains or when you consider math in a general sense. So in the current study, we tested two hypotheses, namely this spatial numerical representation account by investigating the relation between SNARK and mathematics. We tested the hybrid account uh, to see whether there's a relation between the ordinal position effect in mathematics. And instead of looking to correlations, we first determined the presence of the effect at the, at the level of the individual so that we can make three different groups. People who consistently map from left to right people who did not, do not show a consistent snark effect and people who showed a consistent reversed snark effect. And then to see whether the, uh, those different groups uh, differed in mathematical abilities. And the hypothesis was clear. Those who show strong snark effect 
consistent snark effect in a left to right manner, consistent ordinal position effect should be better in mathematics. Now, how, it, how did we investigate this? First, using parity judgment, speeded mental arithmetic, and a curriculum based math tasks to have a more general measurement of mathematics. And then we divided them in different, in these three different groups. We observed the snark effect at the group level. We had enough participants in the different groups. And then we performed a multivariate ANOVA with the two math tasks as dependent variable and group as independent. And as you can see here, this uh, ANOVA did not show a relation between snark and math abilities. Then in the second experiment, we tried to replicate these findings and to see whether, on the contrary, we could find an, an, an effect of the ordinal position effect in relation to mathematical abilities. And in this case, we again showed the effect that, in the, uh, that we showed both effects and also a uh, consistency in uh, the three different groups. We replicated the uh, lack of an uh, of a result of an, uh, correlation or lack of an effect with respect to the snark effect. But now we did observe an, uh, an effect of the ordinal position effect in mathematics. And here uh, the, it turned out that the people who map their working memory in a left to right fashion outperformed the two other groups in terms of mathematics. Now in the third experiment, uh, we try to replicate again these findings of Edling between ordinal position effect and uh, mathematical abilities, but we also try to understand why they were better in maths. And therefore we included the backward digit span because it was known that capacity of working memory also relates to math abilities and also the ability to judge number triplets and to see whether there are group differences in, in this task as well. Again, effect present at the group level. Uh, again, the uh, multivariate ANOVA showed that the left to right coders outperformed the people who do not show a consistent ordinal position effect or a right to left ordinal position effect. Interestingly, if you just look at the size of the effects, you see that those who map from left to right uh, are one up to one and a half standard deviations better in math compared to the other groups. But now it becomes interesting those who show, uh, who organize their memory from left to right have also a higher backward digit span, so a better working memory capacity and are faster in judging numerical triplets. So together, it seems that it's not the spatial representation of number itself that relates to mathematical ability, uh, but that probably structuring working memory in a spatial manner, so st structuring ordinal information in verbal working memory in a spatial manner is helpful, well, helpful when performing mathematics. And it is not just the use of space, but coding this according to our reading habits. And probably that this is due to the optimal functioning of order processing and order coding in working memory. So now when you come back to uh, the, the, the first slide of, of my talk, it does seems to be the case that some aspects of numerical information are somehow associated with some aspects of space and some of them are associated with map ability. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Uh, so I will try to be as concise as possible with my talk so that we have a minute or two for the, uh, for the discussion. Uh, Uh, just... Okay, so this is, uh, uh, yeah, it would be about explicit and directional SNAs. So we know that there are multiple planes in which SNAs can be categorized, um, as we could see in, in the uh, talk by Costas. So here, we, so we know that there are those different, uh, different planes. And what happens if we uh, if we just use only one, we probably get kind of constrained picture, right? So here we just asked ourselves what happens if we leave that open for the participants to decide or to do this explicit association of numbers in the, at least in the two dimensional uh, space. So the task was extremely easy. The participants uh, were shown this kind of six by six grid and these uh, numbers, they are, as you see, like non-symbolic and also not organized in very canonical or, or, or their like dice patterns or so. 
And the, the task was simply put uh, cards with different numbers of dots into this grid, put only one card into each space of the grid. So extremely open, uh, extremely open instruction. And uh, we tested two groups. One of them is, I think, quite interesting. It's a group of uh, Tsimane people. This is an uh, indigenous group living in rainforest of uh, Bolivia, uh, doing most of the time uh, sustainable farming uh, and like some small scale uh, production of some, some items. But this is definitely non-industrialized group. And what is also very important here is that the education there is like not structured, so to say, in each village, one person is given the role of the, of the teacher and just like leads the education of the, of the children from the village. And also the, there is quite huge variation in the, let's say, literacy level of the, and numeracy level of Tsimane people. Some of them can have kind of up to high school education. So to say they went outside the village in order to, to, to get some, to attend like public school in Bolivia. And some of them are uh, simply, are simply uh, having one year of schooling or no schooling and, have really hard time in telling whatever how old they are and, and so on. And uh, we also tested for a comparison a group of German uh, speaking uh, students. So this is Tsimane, they live in the in Bolivia in this part of Bolivia specifically and here we can see some uh, some Tsimane uh, villages. Uh, this is our uh, permission to, to collect the data there. Uh, issued by Grand Council of Tsimane, so like Grand, like Big Council of, of Tsimane, which is kind of self-administration body of, of Tsimane communities. Uh, this is more or less how the, uh, how the villages look like. Uh, it was quite an adventure to, to visit them and to collect the data. And uh, how we uh, tried to make sense out of this data or categorize it. So we had this two by two, uh, uh, so, sorry, six by six grid and like not going much into details, we just classified this arrangements that participants made as either horizontal, vertical, which were in fact sagittal because the, the, the card was just like on the table. Uh, then diagonal one would be like from the left top to uh, right bottom and diagonal two would be the, the, the other diagonal. And then also some participants who did not do this arrangement in the kind of, in any of these would be classified as other. And what we can see here, it's the comparison between the uh, control group uh, of German students and Tsimane people. And this difference is significant. And what we can see here is actually for Tsimane, they like strongly preferred the vertical arrangement while in case of uh, German controls, the most, uh, the most prevalent, uh, prevalent ones were the uh, diagonal one and, and horizontal one. And uh, what we also did here, um, to, we wanted to check whether this uh, preference for vertical uh, mapping uh, in Tsimane people somehow relates to their level of education. We just classified it into groups of like no education, one to five years and above five. It's kind of proxy because se several times the education is just like repeating the same material every year. So it's hard to classify that it's like grade five, grade six, seven grades of teaching. So we use this one just for, for convenience reasons, so to say. And then we see that this preference was not linked at least in case of this two by two, uh, two by two grade by, um, by educational level. So uh, sort of cautionary notes uh, uh, kind of methodologically about this study and also like regarding all other, how much of what we think we know about SNAs is really about SNAs. And it's not just a function of the task constraints we impose on our participants. If we just, we also had these conditions that we had like horizontal grid only, like six, six spaces or vertical one only. But what happens if we, if we just give participants more freedom Maybe we should come back to Galton and, and simply ask the participants. Maybe they have some strong preferences of like linking numbers, this or the other way around. And combining this information of just asking the participants uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with some other information that we, uh, that we can obtain from other more formalized tasks, 
yeah, and then more questions than answers. Thanks so much uh, to, to my collaborators and to you for your attention. Yep, yeah. so uh, we are still five minutes left. So very happy to have uh, questions or comments. I had a question for Nicolas. Um, and whether the, uh, the people that he tested, the Arabic speaking people that he tested in Belgium, whether they, um, what the age of the people was, whether they already followed some, some education and whether they, for example, uh, already learned or were familiar with uh, yeah, the way how we do maths here in, in, in Belgium. No, so we, we tested them um, mostly in uh, immigrant centers um, and we, we selected people that could not speak French, could not speak English or have or very, very little knowledge about, about that. And they were still speaking uh, Arabic and reading Arabic on, on daily basis. Um, so there's almost no, oops, there's a, uh, sorry, sorry, I, I had connect like, much with, with, yeah, sorry. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so they had almost no knowledge of, uh, of English, French or, and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thanks. I have a message from Martin. He wants to ask a question to uh, to Costas. So, yes. Uh, Martin, we cannot hear you, or at least I cannot. Okay, better now. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's, 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 yeah, sorry. It's, it's better, yes. Um, so I just gave compliments to all speakers, very fascinating talks. And my specific question to Konstantinos um, about the um, apparent additivity of the three different planes that were um, contributing to the overall snark. Um, is it the case that uh, you can compute with a simple subtraction logic, how much each of the different planes weighs into the overall spatial numerical association? And if so, do you have enough people in your design to look for order effects, to check whether there is some sort of spillover depending on which of the planes the person has first experienced? Because I'm so surprised that horizontal plane alone has no spatial mapping. Yes, uh, we have uh, 79 participants. And uh, of course, uh, I fully agree that uh, we can go on uh, further with the analysis regarding order. We don't have available for the moment uh, uh, this analysis, but I'm pro I promise that uh, we're going to check it out and I will let you know immediately on all these uh, effects. My explanation is that uh, probably uh, we don't have uh, the, uh, uh, an effect with plane three when only the horizontal axis is active because simultaneously in this case, the two other axes are incompatible. So I think so that maybe this creates some kind of, um, I don't, uh, I cannot call it rumor, or, but uh, probably at the level on which the snark effects uh, arise, this information uh, is uh, in, in a sense opposite, opposing. Uh, so at least when we have at least two axes or two planes to be uh, precise, uh, going to the same direction, two, two axes, uh, then the third axis is uh, the loser or something like this. But uh, I fully agree and uh, I will go to check it more in, uh, in, the, in the detail. Uh, Sarah has his uh, PhD discussion now, so it's the right uh, point uh, to check it out and uh, have a clear uh, uh, response on this. The only thing that uh, I can say is that uh, when all three uh, 
axes go to the same direction. We have the highest effect. We have an intermediate uh, effect for uh, the two axes with some differences between them. And then we have uh, no effect for uh, only uh, one axis. So this, uh, in a sense, uh, is a further suggestion that uh, there are uh, interactions um, and um, this is the only thing that I can say now. So thank you very, very much for the suggestion, and I will, I will contact you by email to to give you the results. Great. Thanks very much for the answer. Thank you very much. Sorry, I have to leave now. I have a question for Jean Philippe. I mean, just a moment. So, like, we can probably stay a moment, right, Ilza? But but for those of you who cannot stay, just wanted to to thank you so much for for attending, and yeah, see you next time. Thanks. Thank you very much. Sorry, go on, Hatze. I have a little bit background noise here from my son. Um, the question is simple. I mean, that when the when the working memory is marked, targets working memory, and working memory plays a role in arithmetic, then it's clear that there could be a relation. But why from left to right and not so much from right to left? <laughs> That's a good question. Why, why um, are the people who do spend their working memory to arrange things from right to left, at least in your culture, yeah. are not so much better in math? That's the point I didn't quite understand. Yeah, I don't have an explanation for that. Uh, what I only can say is that yeah, I don't know from where, it, uh, where what the origin is of what the reason is, but those who map consistently according to the dominant reading direction here in Belgium that is from left to right, that those outperform those who map from right to left consistent. I don't know why. Uh, it's it's something that needs to be further uh, further investigated. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the background of my question is the paper we have with Chishik, where we found no snark in mathematical, prof professional mathematics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there we say a good thing to be spatially flexible or maybe spatially more ab abstract so you know like following our paper i mean i don't doubt the results i could also say maybe people who are more spatially flexible and go right to left in a culture which is left to right maybe they are better but i mean this is not what you found that you found the opposite yeah yeah now here in in, in our group um, based on your paper, we decided to, uh, to, 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 to rule out those with more than three and a half standard, more than three standard deviations uh, from, uh, from the average math performance. So we don't have those people who are very strong in math. So um, therefore this flexibility uh, can be, uh, now I don't know those who, who map their order from right to left, whether they are necessarily, well, this is not necessarily a sign of, of flexibility. Uh, then from that perspective, you would expect that those people who do not consistently show a snark, that they, uh, that they are better. And um, well, probably in the group that we, that we uh, have here now, in the group who do not show a consistent snark effect, you probably have people who don't have it because of their flexibility. And you have people who don't have it because they are just, uh, who doesn't have it because they are not so strong, not so good in it. So you have probably the combination of the two. And therefore, you probably also have this huge, rather big overlap. In, in, in If you look to the individual data points of the left-right coders and the right-left coders, there is a huge overlap. So probably the groups, this group of non-consistent snarkers contains partly those who are bad in mathemat mathematics, but also maybe those who are, have a flexible mapping of numbers to space or can flexi flexibly change between mappings. Yeah. So that's a good, uh, a good suggestion to, to, to consider or to, to, think, to further think about it. So thank you very much. Do we have any other questions or comments or? I guess I don't see anyone willing to ask. So yeah, then thank you so much for, for coming to this, let's say rather specific 
symposium in a sense of like specificity of the of the scope and yeah wish you a good weekend thanks so much thank you christoph thank you thank very you very much all the presenters you're welcome thank you too for organizing and hosting this <laughs> next week we have a, a new poster session if you're interested so uh, do come along on friday next week thank you Many, Bye -bye. many thanks Bye. for everything. Goodbye, many thanks. <laughs>